This is a Drosophila embryo. It's, uh, there are about 100 cells in this direction. We can see all the cells look initially pretty much the same. This is a process of gastrulation. And what you can see in the course of this movie is uh, that things get, first of all, you see things get more and more complex. You have a set of cells. Everything looks pretty much the same. So most of these early morphological changes that are happening must, are first of all, very rapid. And if we're going to explain them, we have to explain them in terms of uh, the way cells adhere to each other and the way that they generate forces on each other through uh, acting myosin cytoskeleton. Now, to analyze these processes and to get a better hand, handle on how these things actually occur at the cellular and at the tissue level, we've done two things in the lab. We first of all developed optical techniques at the single photon and two photon uh, multi-photon level to follow and track and observe the behaviors of individual cells in all these embryos. And the next thing, though, was once you have a, uh, is to develop software and analytical tools that allow us to track cells and reconstruct their behavior. Well, thank you very much, Eric, for spending a little cool. bit of time with us and answering a, a few questions. So my first question is related to the topic of the, of the session we have this afternoon in the meeting, uh, principles of, uh, of um, quantitative principles of uh, morphogenesis. And the question is, uh, in biology, cells, biological processes are typically noisy. Biological matter is a very soft matter. Yet uh, embryonic development is very precise, very reproducible, robust. How is this possible? Wow. <laughs> I wish I knew. I mean, you know, based, and that's what we're going to be yeah. talking about, I yeah. guess. I think it's always true that when you don't know what's going on, things can look a lot more noisy yeah. than when you suddenly, when you understand. The other interesting possibility, though, and I honestly don't know which of these is the right one, is that somehow noise through some peculiar mathematics adds up to not be noise anymore. And that we don't, and in that sense, it's not that there's any little pathway or direct or single pathway, but that the reproducibility that we see somehow, I don't know, emerges as some product, some higher mathematical or organizational principle. So that's, that's an idea that fascinates me. It probably fascinates me because I don't really understand it. And I hang around my physicist friends who try to explain this, these possibilities to me. They're still, they're still fascinating. So I, I don't know where to put my money on this. You bet. mentioned your collaboration with physicists, your friends, physicists. Yeah. How does that go? Are there how is the communication between an experimental biologist and a theoretical physicist like William uh, Bialik going? Yeah. What did you learn from them? Okay, um, you, what I, well, I, from a practical standpoint, I've uh, learned a lot about myself. I've learned that I really only can do this on a personal basis. Mm -hmm. I have to have, have to work with people who are patient enough to explain it. I used to, I used to think physics was cool and you know we all studied physics, we all studied math, we all forgot physics, we all forgot math and uh, and that's part of the pleasure for me is to have people whom I respect explain things and kind of bring me, I don't know, quite, it's not quite bring me, it's not like bring me back to being a young college student trying to learn uh, calculus and Newtonian physics anymore. But it is kind of like bringing me to some place other than where I am right now. And so that's, that's what I think is really, really mm -hmm. crucial. I, from the biologist standpoint, is you have to find people who are willing to do this. And you yourself have to take great pleasure mm -hmm. in that. So one of the general. Uh, realizations or uh, a conceptualization that's helped us a lot in looking at gastrulating embryos is that we found that it's useful to partition the general morphogenetic movements that are occurring in these embryos into two 
broad classes. There are ones that we'll call transient. If you look at an embryo, you see a transient fold here, someplace else. And there are other events that happen during gastrulation uh, that are permanent and result, folds that result in permanent internalizations. Interestingly, although this wasn't necessarily to be expected, these two types, transient and permanent, seem to evolve, involve very different molecular and cellular mechanisms. And are, are there results now, from your own experiments or in the lab, that you have uh, obtained recently that puzzle you and you're dying to understand them? Oh. Yeah. Almost all the time, yeah. All the time. All the time. I mean, it's, I, the way you science, the science works is always that you kind of, um, you have a framework, and you put stuff into the framework, and if nothing ever fit in the framework, you, you'd feel really frustrating, yeah, frustrated. And, and yet, there are things which we see happening that fit kind of in the descriptive framework, and yet when you sit down and think about it, you don't understand why they happen. Right, right. now the big thing is that we believe as cell biologists that cell membranes are really important mm -hmm. for everything. Mm. And uh, we watch and make movies of cells moving around, and that's a big block of cytoplasm, big block of nuclei, but we think in terms of units being, uh, units of force being defined by separating this mass of cytoplasm nuclei into cells by putting membranes around them. And that's where the forces are. That's how the whole thing works, by having these little units. And we want to reduce it down to the activity units. But we've, in the weird, a weird genetic experiment, we've we found that we could eliminate all the membranes, or most of the membranes. You eliminate all the partitioning, have a big goo of cytoplasm. And yet, the embryo goes on and does its stuff. So. I mean, it's those kind of things that keep you going into the lab every day because, I mean, not every day, hopefully, <laughs> not every day, but hopefully often enough something is going to happen that throws you for, a, you know, that, that throws your perceptions out of, out of whack, out of where they should be. Now, you, you mentioned, you know, the, the genetic approach and, and the quantitative approach and from, yeah. from the very famous EMBL experiments there, for yeah. which you received the Nobel Prize in, in Heidelberg. Um, you moved to a more quantitative analysis yeah. of biological processes. And can you explain us why it is important to understand quantitatively some biological uh, processes? I think one of the, th what I find attractive about quantitative approaches is that you, that the first rigorous step in translating a process into math. And math, mathing something out is probably the most rigorous way of testing how you think. And in a way, numbers then is like genetics in that they're both have this powerful ability to test your preconceptions. Mm -hmm. you, we all come into the world of biology, we come in with, a percep with perception, with cartoon models in our heads. Mm -hmm. And you, when you measure something, you don't really know what the number is going to be until you get the number out. And when you do a genetic experience, you don't really know what mutants you're going to get until you get the, until the mutants come out. You don't really know what the phenotypes are. And so in both those cases, you, that starting from not knowing, and even in a certain sense, well, not even, ideally not even having a preconception, uh, is a powerful place to be in, in biology. So now you are teaching, I think, a fair amount. Yeah. Um, is there any advice you, you could give to young researchers how to do good science? <sighs> and te a good, to do good science, I mean, uh, good science, you go into the lab and you try to figure out something cool and interesting and you 
understand that what's expected of you is to be successful. I mean, it's not enough to go into the lab and feel like you're going in the lab and being a scientist. I mean, your job is to do the experiment that suddenly explains something or that makes, you know, it's not your job isn't to be a scientist. Your job is to get your experiments to work. And, but what those experiments are has to come from inside you and you have to you have to do the only way you're gonna do a really good experiment is if it's the one that really fascinates you. So you have to be successful. You have to get things to work. But and it has to come it has to be the thing that you that you want that you want to do and that fascinates you. Yeah. So in uh, in the early stages of your career did you have mentors or scientific heroes that really influenced you or that you admired? And I mean, realistically, I, had, I worked in great labs. I studied with, um, even as an undergraduate, studied uh, in a fly lab and, and, and then as a graduate student worked in uh, and, uh, Don Polson's lab, Walter Gehring's lab. In a way, though, my greatest mentors have been my collaborators, the people that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, it's still true for me and my students and my postdocs, but if I think back, a lot, a, a lot of my development as a scientist came from the kind of uh, uh, I suppose this is the, the kind of interactions that, you know, or the, the way that you discuss with your, um, uh, with your colleagues or the people who are doing experiments, uh, who you're doing experiments with. And my last question is about your immediate future now. I think you are taking sabbatical for yeah. a little while oh, and uh, coming back to Heidelberg at the right. EMBL. Yeah. Can you give us a feel of what type of project of ideas you will be? Okay, I I don't know. I'm just terribly practically driven. I, I, um, I'm i actually going back to uh, Stefano Dorensis's lab. He was a postdoc before in my lab before he uh, set up his own lab at Embo and I'm actually, I have this view of this year's sabbatical going back to different, you know, former collaborators' labs, uh, collaborators with whom we, I, I never finished, or we never finished some experiment, and, and, and they were sometimes really cool experiments that I really, but then people go off and get jobs and get other interests and everything, and I feel kind of like the Commodore in and Don Giovanni, that I was just going to show up at these past people's <laughs> and say, mm, we want this, in a, in a basso or something that we want, this experiment has to be done, or the, the fires of hell will open up. And so, I'm sure they are now, they are all trembling already. <laughs> yeah, right. But I mean, no, basically, the idea, um, to little small things, I think. Um, Often, you know, there's also this wonderful thing. You think you're going to finish an experiment, you just have to make it through this last door, but then often you make it through the door, and sometimes it's these little experiments that are kind of unexplained that you make it through this door, and then whoa, you, you, you realize that you're in some terrible new territory that's truly frightening and scary and exciting, and that's where you want to be as a scientist.